Welcome home. Man, I, it's so good. I can't, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around the fact that Easter was seven days ago. And man, it was an amazing weekend. Thanks for those of you. How many of you were out here last weekend for Easter? Good, man, it was unbelievable. We had over 3,000 people came up for our Sunday services. We had a ton, thousands of people came out on Saturday for our extravaganza. Our Good Friday service was beautiful, packed house in here too. So anything you were able to come to, I'm sure you were blessed. And thank you for those of you who brought folks along. It was just, just an awesome weekend. We are in the midst of an amazing season of growth here at the church. And so you saw in the video this morning, in just a few weeks, we're changing our service times to accommodate more people. So if you just walked in, starting on April, that's this month, right? April 28th, we'll be meeting together at 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.45 a.m. And so what that means is that you gotta start thinking about when you're gonna come. I know you all said you wanna be early birds, we're not going to hold you to it, but I'd love to hold you to it because we imagine that 10 o'clock is going to be our most full service. And so if you're a regular attender of our church, we'd love it if you, especially in this first season, could commit to coming to the early or the late service so we can make some room at 10 o'clock for folks visiting because every week we get tons of p folks who are coming up for the first time. And there's a lot of things that we can do to get ready for that. The next few weeks, we're still dealing with parking issues. So anytime you can come now at nine and carpool or park in the lot on the bottom of the hill, that helps us a ton uh, to make some room for our visitors as we're preparing to launch three services in just three weeks. And so we're a, a little shy of volunteers still for moving to three services. We need about 50 volunteers to help with our welcome team and a few dozen volunteers to help with our kids ministry team. And so if you haven't signed up to volunteer yet, you don't have to sign up for forever, but just to help us kind of launch this first wave of services, we'll have some, uh, some folks in the lobby today after the service, and we'd love to just get you to sign up to come and help at one of our new three services starting on April 28th. Just once a month or so, come on up and volunteer on a Sunday morning. Good? Are you guys awake? It's a daylight savings, man. Okay. Okay, okay. If you have Bibles, you can open them to Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. We start a new section in the Sermon on the Mount today that, that kind of links to the last one. We'll talk about how in a moment. But let me just read this first verse of Matthew 6 for us where we'll spend our time today. Jesus continues in his teaching by saying this. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. This is God's word. Taking notes today, you can pull that outline out or open up your Three Crosses app and, and check in as we walk through it together. But I'd love to start with an image to put in your brains. I want you to think about how meaningful and significant it is when you do something selfless and honoring for a person that you love. You know, imagine that a, a close friend or a family member or someone you care deeply about has a milestone event in their life. And maybe it's a milestone birthday or an anniversary, a promotion at work or a graduation from school. And, and as a close friend, you're thinking, I want to do something meaningful, significant, special to honor this person. And so you go to the store and you pick them out some extravagant gift that's way beyond your normal budget for your friendship. You make reservations at a restaurant that's nicer than you would normally go to with this friend because you just want to make it a special time. And you, you kind of play it cool. You tell them, hey, let's go out. Let's celebrate your promotion. I want to make it special. Let's dress up. It'll be fun. I'm going to cover everything. And then you show up at this restaurant and your friend's looking at you like, seriously? You're like, this is a special night? And you order the food, you order the uh, desserts, you're having a great time together, you take the bill, you pay for it yourself, and you say, hey, before you go though, I bought something for you. And you take out whatever this gift is, and you slide it across the table, and they open it, and they kind of look at you like, are you serious? This is too much, this is too much. All right, maybe you wrote them, if you're a sentimental person, you wrote them a card, and they're like crying as they read this card. And, and as simple as that is, right, it's one evening out. There's something beautiful and rewarding about an act of service for someone that you love deeply. 
Now, the reason that, that I bring up this example and I want it to stick in your minds is because this is kind of how to imagine the transition from Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 5, we, we spent several weeks talking about the power of living as people of purity in the world outside of our doors. And what does it mean to purify ourselves from anger and retaliation and lust and all of these seeds of sin that can take us down? What if we, became, what if we came to a place that we can walk out the doors into the world and be such pure people of integrity that God's light just shines through us? That's the, that's the theme of Matthew chapter 5. And then we turn the page here into Matthew chapter six, and we have a, a new list of practices and things to wrestle with that, that are slightly different. Instead of merely talking about having hearts of integrity, now Jesus is talking about demonstrating our faith with deeds of integrity. He calls them acts of righteousness. And as he starts walking us through these acts of righteousness, we start to get a glimpse of the power that would happen if we do these deeds of love that come out of a pure heart of faith in the world outside of our doors. What if we spent time fasting for those who are in need? What if we spent time praying for God's kingdom to come? What if we spent time quietly giving to the needy and making this world a better place? What if we made something of our faith in a beautiful, powerful way? It would be just as rewarding as an act of service for a friend over dinner. There'd be something beautiful about the way we've chosen to live if we chose to live in a way where we really made something of our faith in the world outside our doors. And yet, the, the reason we're camping out on verse one for this, this whole time together today is that Jesus shows us in every one of these passages in Matthew six that there's a temptation, like in chapter five, there's a, the seed of sin that can exist in our hearts that if we don't learn how to identify it and extract it, it can nullify the action we're trying to do. Right? There's a way to honor your friend over a dinner, and there's a way not to honor your friend over dinner. And Jesus says, there's a way to honor the Lord with your acts of righteousness. There's a way not to honor the Lord with your acts of righteousness. And moreover, he says, there's something in our hearts that if we don't become aware of it, it can poison the well so that all of the good we're trying to do with our faith in the world has no impact. He says, if you do it this way, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And so I wanna camp out in this verse today and start to equip us with some radar for this sin that exists in all of our hearts. And so if you're taking notes today, we're gonna walk through it today. I wanna to kinda of explain it, set the scene, walk us through the content, and then at the end, we'll kinda of hit, so this is what this means, this is what this means, this is what this means. Right, the first thing you see on your notes is that in order to understand this verse and the rest of chapter six, we need to know what Jesus means when he says the phrase, acts of righteousness, works of righteousness, practices of righteousness. He says in this passage, be careful not to practice your righteousness before men. So if you're taking notes, here's a working definition of acts of righteousness, uh, using the tools of faith to bring God's kingdom into the world. So when Jesus says practicing righteousness, don't picture a baseball player practicing baseball. When he says practicing righteousness, picture a doctor practicing medicine. Right? Using the tools of the trade that bring wellness into the world. When we practice righteousness of, as Christians, we use the tools of the Christian faith to bring God's kingdom into the world. And when Jesus talks about prayer, he says, as you pray, pray that God's kingdom would come, that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. He says, when you fast, you're longing, hungering, aching for the world to be made right. You want the kingdom of God to be here. When you're giving to the poor and helping those who are disenfranchised, serving those in need, what you're doing in those moments is you're writing the scales in a sense. You're making this world look a little bit more like it's supposed to look. Acts of righteousness are when you're using the tools of faith to bring God's kingdom into the world. And Jesus says, when you start to step into these actions, making something of your faith, Here's what you need to be aware of. I'll read it again from verse one. He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. And I know that none of us think we do this. 
And so I'm gonna devote most of the rest of our time to helping us see that we actually do this. But the temptation that, that Jesus draws out in the passage, and you can write this down, is that there's a temptation in each of us to do righteous acts for unrighteous reasons. Righteous acts for unrighteous reasons. Prayer, fasting, giving to the needy, serving someone who's sick, going across the street to check on a neighbor you haven't seen in a while. There's a, a way to do these righteous acts for unrighteous reasons. The character, or more likely the, the caricature that we get to see of what not to do in these acts of righteousness throughout the Sermon on the Mount are the Pharisees. And the Pharisees in Jesus' day were the religious leaders, kind of the religious elite that the people were supposed to look up to. These were the men who knew what they were doing when it came to faith and its practice. And Jesus over and over again says, let me tell you what not to do. Don't be like them. And he gives examples. It says, these are men that when they pray, they time their prayer life to coincide with the most busy times in public pray places. And so when the three o'clock prayer bell chimes, they just happen to be standing on the corner of a busy intersection and say, well, I guess I'll pray right here. God, thank you that I'm so amazing, unlike all of these folks around me today, right? So this is what not to do. So these are men that when they practice fasting on Tuesdays and Thursdays, that's when Pharisees would fast, uh, they made a huge deal. Oh, I'm so hungry today. It's my fasting day for the Lord. And so it's just hard being so spiritual all the time. <laughs> Don't be like that. These are men, and I don't know if in Matthew 6 this was something literally they would do or not. I think they actually would literally do this. He said, when they give to the poor, they announce it with trumpets. You imagine like, bah, 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 right? And then a religious leader shows up with a giant check for like $25. Like, this is for you. Go buy yourself a Big Mac. <laughs> don't be like them. Be careful he says not to practice your acts of righteousness before people to be seen by them. And, and I want to just draw out today, I don't think that any of you do any of these things. I haven't seen you at least. And I hope you've never seen me do any of these things. Right? Praying in public, right? Or trying to get credit, calling uh, the news to come when I go and help an old woman across the street. I, I don't think any of us do this. And I don't actually think that anyone in Jesus' audience during the Sermon on the Mount did those things as well. I think these were the people who were lowly and humble and the, the salt of the earth type folks that we read about in the beginning of Matthew chapter five. I don't think he was condemning the actual practices of his actual audience. I think he was condemning their role models and I think he was also giving them the warning to say, the seed of sin that grows into behavior like that that seed of sin exists in you too. So be careful not to do righteous things for unrighteous reasons. Now I was thinking about that, that example of taking someone out to dinner, giving them a big gift for a milestone event. And right, I said there's, there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. Right, and I think some of us may have maybe have done some of these things the wrong way. Imagine you did the same thing, bought a nice gift, took someone out to a nice dinner, but the, the whole time you're just taking photos and uploading it to social media, right? You're on the phone with your friends in the car on the way to this nice dinner, like, oh yeah, I'm taking Joan out for her birthday. It's a milestone event. I'm taking her somewhere really nice. I'm paying the bill, so it's on me tonight. I hope she likes it. And Joan's like, yeah, here I am, right? You slide the gift across the table, and as she's opening, she's like, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on, hold on. I want to do this on Instagram Live, right? And you hold up your phone, right? And you get a light, and you turn it back on yourself. Here we are, right? And I'm about to give a special gift to Joan. We do live in a culture where, where we document everything on social media. And in that world, if you took that social media culture into this special event, my guess is that the more public you became with your demonstration of these gifts, the less meaningful it would be for the person you're trying to honor. There's a chance they might even come and say, hey, honestly, 
you can have your gift back because are you giving it to me or are you giving it to yourself? Because it feels like this night was supposed to be about my graduation, but you're getting a lot of likes for your graduation YouTube video you just uploaded, right? Be careful because there's something in us that I would guess that most of us don't even recognize it's there. Where we love to do good things and then find ways to get credit for it. Have you ever had that? Right, you get compelled by the Lord to do something beautiful. Right, you're going to go give something to someone in need, or you're going to go and care for an elderly relative, or take someone out to coffee and share your faith with them, and it goes really well, and it's a very beautiful time, and, and you come home, and you're feeling great. It was a rewarding experience, and then there's something in you that just wants to pick up the phone and call everyone you know and tell them what you did. Right? And in that moment, it doesn't feel like you're trying to get credit, but I bet in that moment, if I showed up in your house and said, hey, what, what if you never told anyone about what you did yesterday? You would start to feel this ache of like, I don't know if I want to not tell anyone about that. Because there's something in us that even likes to take the purely motived righteous things that we've done and then turn them and maximize the glory for ourselves even without realizing we want to do it. Now, I'll give you the converse example. I, as a pastor, sometimes I kind of get this front row seat to really humble righteous acts that people do, and they don't want any credit for it. And I'll tell you, when I hear these stories, they're the most beautiful stories. Imagine them. And I'll run into somebody and say, hey, I haven't seen you at church for a while. And they're like, I'm so sorry. Uh, my spouse has been suffering with this disease and she can't walk and she can't feed herself and she can't take care of her daily needs. And so I'm 100% of the time at her bedside and I love to just kind of sneak out, come up to church and then sneak back home again. But the last few weeks she's just taken a turn and it's been really hard and I haven't been able to sneak out. So I'm so sorry. I'm like, wait, you do that every day? I'm like yeah, every day for the last eight years. That's, that's my life. I'm like, how come I never knew about this? Well, I've never told anyone about this. It just feels weird to talk about my wife. She's going through a hard time, and my closest friends know, but I didn't feel like I need to tell you all. And I'm thinking, this is your, you, I just think that you're here. Every, you, this is what you're doing behind closed doors? Every once in a while, somebody calls me, and they say, I'm, I don't want to call you about this. I don't want to tell you about this, but we just sold a property, and we made a bunch of money, and we gave a, a very large donation to the church, Please forget about this phone call the moment we hang up. I just want to call to see if you got it because I've never written a check this big before and I'm terrified it's like not, I put it in the wrong box or whatever. And I'm like, let me find out. I find out, hey, we got the check. Okay, thank you. And then they always say this, please don't tell anyone that I told you about this. Like I, and I'm thinking, this is amazing. This person's not looking for credit. They don't want their name on a plaque on the wall, right? They, I don't think in that moment they're calling me to get some gold star with me, right? You can tell by the tone of someone's voice. They're so ashamed about sharing this beautiful thing that they did. And I find out somebody comes to me and says, hey, hey, how can I pray for you this week? And so I tell them, and, and they say, you know, just so you know, my, my spouse and I, we pray for you every day. I'm like, every day? You pray for me? Like, and I say, yeah, um, we take two hours every morning and we've got a list of all of these people in our lives and, and before we get up and the kids get up, we, we just walk through this list and we, we pray for everyone that we really want God to be working in in this season and you're on that list. I'm like, two hours every morning you do this? They're like, yeah, yeah, I wish I didn't tell you that. I'm sorry, like, I just want to know how I can pray for you this week. And I'm thinking like, I just got a glimpse into something beautiful that they've been keeping secret for a long time. Right, sometimes right, going public with an act of righteousness cheapens the experience. Other times being secret with an act of righteousness almost elevates the experience. And so one of the questions that I wrote down in my notes to kind of put out for you guys this week is this. Would you be willing to cultivate one or two righteous acts in your life that you are committed to never telling anyone ever about? For some of us, that's like energizing. For others of us, it's energizing until we do it. 
And then we're gonna start noticing this temptation that's in us, that everything in us, for some reason, wants to find other ways to get credit for this beautiful thing that we've done for the Lord. When Jesus, as he moves forward in this warning here, he says, be careful not to do your right, acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. He says, if you do, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And I spent a long time these last couple weeks just asking, what does he mean by reward? And I was like, if you pray and you don't tell anyone, do you get like an extra like gold chain in your like angel necklace in heaven or something? You get like a cool, like, do you get like a water slide on your pool in your mansion when you get, when you die? What is this reward that God is giving us? And, and the more I looked into it, the more I studied it, the, the less I felt like the rewards that he's talking about are some like bells and whistles and trumpets, like what the Pharisees wanted type of awards. And the more I think that, that he's basically just talking about the fact that, that when you do these acts of righteousness properly, it's a rewarding experience. It's rewarding for you. It's rewarding for them, right? Great is your reward in heaven. You did something not for the kingdom of earth, but for the kingdom of heaven. It's rewarded in the sense that if you prayed for something, the reward is that God answers that prayer. It's rewarded that when you fast and mourn for something, God moves forward the ball of the kingdom in terms of your fasting. It's rewarded that when you go and bring something to someone in need, the reward is that now their provisions are being met. I'm thinking 90% of what God is saying in terms of your reward in heaven is that this act that you've done will be a rewarding act. It's going to accomplish what you've set out to do and bring care to someone. Grow and strengthen your relationship. See someone's heart turn in faith. Change their life just for a moment. Give them a touch of God's love. That is the reward you get for that experience, is that what you intended and prayed for happens. But over and over again, Jesus says in Matthew chapter six, that if you do these righteous acts, looking for accolades, looking for credit, looking for a gold star from your pastor or from your friend or small group leader. He's like, you'll probably get those things, but that's all the reward you're gonna get. It's almost like I said before, there's an inverse relationship between the more secret your act is, the more rewarding it is, and the more you publicize your act, the less rewarding it becomes. If, if you do it this way, you'll have no reward from your father who is in heaven. Again, I don't think any of us think that we do this. I don't think any of us do this on purpose a lot. But I think especially in our culture where we're looking for ways to monetize everything, where we're looking for ways to promote everything on social media, where we're looking for ways to get multiple benefits out of one action all the time. Hey, I can serve this person and get some Instagram likes. Hey, I can give to the needy person and look good in the process. There's something in us that this whole system we live in is built around that wants to give glory to ourselves. And God says, listen, you can't borrow glory from me. Either you're going to do this act in a way that I am glorified and I shine through you, or you're going to do this act in a way that you get glory and you shine. And it's almost like Jesus saying, I'm not interested in sharing your spotlight. So why don't you choose right now? This act of righteousness you're doing, is it for me or is it for, for you? Because if you want the spotlight, you can have it. But if you want to give it to me, you got to get out of my light. If you're going to let your light shine with your acts of righteousness, the whole goal is that you get out of the way so that the glory goes to God and God alone. I gave you the question of would you be willing to do a righteous act and remain anonymous? Let me give you a, a final question to wrestle with and then I'll, I'll tell you what we can do with these things. The question I'd love to plant in your mind, anytime you're tempted to get some credit for a beautiful thing God has compelled you to do is this question. Would I be willing to cheapen this experience by taking some glory or credit for myself? Would I be willing to cheapen this experience by taking some glory or credit for myself? Because I think that's what Jesus' teaching actually happens that when you go and help your neighbor and tell no one, God, be the glory, 
But when you go help your neighbor and start chatting it up with all your friend groups, to you be the glory. And so before you go and make that call to tell people the awesome thing you just did, ask yourself the question, would I be willing to cheapen this experience by taking some credit for myself? Now this is, just to be honest, a passage that has like exploded my brain in the last two weeks. I've written this sermon three times, I think, and met with our team. I think I'm going this way. And then, hey, can we meet again tomorrow? I think I'm actually gonna go this way, right? Because a lot of it, especially as, as those of us who lead ministries here at the church, this is like real life for us. We are the most likely people to become the Pharisee caricatures because part of my role at the church is to stand in front of you and demonstrate what it looks like to live a life of faith. And, and I'll be honest, for, for all of my preaching, ever since I first started, this was instilled in me by the people who mentored me, I've been very mindful of the illustrations I give about my own life. Most of the stories you'll hear about me make me look like an idiot because I am, right? And yet every once in a while, I come across something in my own life that's been helpful for me and I think, okay, I wanna share this because I think it'll actually equip people well. And so I'll bring out a story. Hey, the other day, you know, I did this and, and it, it was a beautiful thing. You should do it too, right? Or the other, this practice that I've developed in my life around this category of spirituality has really been meaningful to me. And, and I always try really hard to make sure that I'm never giving those stories to get credit, but only to be helpful. But here's the sobering thing that, that struck me this week as I wrestled through this, is, is that even though I personally and all of our ministry leaders work really hard not to get any glory for anything that we ourselves have done, I have noticed that the few times in these last five years, as I kind of scope it back since I started in this role, that I've taken an opportunity to share something with you guys that's been really special and significant to me in my relationship with the Lord for the right reasons I share it with you, I've noticed looking back that those special activities in my life aren't as special as they used to be. Now, I won't tell you what they are because I don't want to become any less special, but uh, there's two things in particular. Where I, I wrestled with, should I tell you this story? Should I tell you about this practice? I do, I think it'll help people. And I got feedback from our team this week. Hey, that actually was really helpful. I'm really glad you told that story. And I said, hey, to be honest though, I used to get so much joy from this act when I did it in secret, but since the moment I shared it, it's like it's, it's just a thing I do now. It doesn't feel it doesn't feel special to me anymore. It's not like the secret I have with, with God. And I never thought about that till I encountered this passage. And so as much as this might feel like a, why does Jesus spend an entire chapter talking about these things question? I do think this is one of those things that, that can tend to go right over our heads because the culture we live in is so diametric, diametrically opposed to this way of living. And I would guess that if you would be willing to create some spiritual practices that you do and are completely anonymous in, not only will God reward them with the results of answered prayers or helping the poor, whatever you're doing, but, but I would guess that the intimacy and connection that you get with the Lord by this secret, spiritual, righteous act will be unlike anything else that you've experienced in your spiritual life so far. And so the two teachings that I pull out of this that you can write down as we prepare to close our time today is number one, that the temptation to get credit for our acts of righteousness is real and dangerous. The temptation is real, the temptation is dangerous. And the second, I'll give you a chance to write it down, real and dangerous. And the second, we could put the second one on the screen too, is that there's something special about righteous acts done anonymously. There's something special about righteous acts done anonymously. And so as you start to wrestle with this this week, just a couple things you can do to, to start this process. Number one, I would love it, let's put this on the screen, if you would identify a practice in your life, intentionally create some practices that are designed to bring God's kingdom to earth. Now maybe you already have them, a, a prayer practice, a, a weekly fasting day, Maybe you serve as, at a soup kitchen or you are helping someone in need in your community or you serve here at the church in some place. Intentionally create some practices in your life that are designed to bring God's kingdom to earth. And then second, put this one on the screen, resist the temptation 
to relish in the credit you might get from these good acts. And please write this down, because you are, you are probably thinking right now, well, I don't do that. I'm telling you, we all do this. I didn't think I did it either until this week. We all do this. Resist the temptation to relish in the credit you might get from these good acts. And then finally, number three, we put it on the screen, then I'll read it for us. Ask God to continue to purify your heart so you can become a selfless, others-centered person. Ask God to purify your heart. The same theme of Matthew 5, live with pure hearts, let your light shine. And let's take this into chapter 6. How do we purify our hearts so that when we do these acts, God's light shines through us, we get no credit, and he gets the spotlight for the things that he has done through us. You know, there's a tension in the midst of all of this. You're going to be tempted to reach out to someone you're praying for and say, hey, I'm praying for you today. And sometimes that's really helpful to do, and it serves them in some way. Other times it's just you trying to get, like, spiritual credit. You know, so wrestle in your own hearts. But create the activities. Resist the urge to get credit. And work on becoming a person with God's help. He it says, it's, it's not about me. It's about you, right? Like John the Baptist says, he must increase I must decrease. I think it's fitting today that, that the way we close our time in the text of Scripture is, is through the communion meal. This communion is a time where we examine our hearts and we say, God, show us any wicked way in us. I, I would ask that as, as you prepare your elements right now and hold this bread in your hand and hold this cup in your hand, that you would start to invite the Lord into even what we've talked about today and say, God, show me if there are places that I'm trying to rob you of your glory. And show me places in my life that I'm trying to look like a big deal. Help me to live in the tension of, of knowing when I'm trying to make a name for myself and I'm getting in front of you trying to make a name for yourself. God, show me if this is something that I do in my life. And as we hold these elements, we, we think of Jesus who who not only performed the most righteous act in the history of the world by, by coming here to save us, by giving himself up for our life, for our forgiveness, but in Jesus Christ, we see the best example of any human who's ever lived to, who works hard to deny the glory that he actually deserves. Like Paul says in Philippians, that though he was in very nature God himself, he humbled himself made himself nothing, took the very form of a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. We see Jesus as he does ministries, as he does his ministry, people start to catch wind of his glory and he just hides, he runs away. He seems very concerned with, with not being in the spotlight even though he is the one who deserves every spotlight. And so think of him, remember him. Remember his act of righteousness on your behalf. As you hold this bread, I'll, I'll take this bread as well. And, and we think back to the night he was betrayed. We're taking bread, Jesus blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. This is my body, he said. Eat this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread together. In the same way he took the cup. And he said to his disciples, this, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. Let's drink the cup together. Let's pray together. Jesus, as we examine ourselves in this moment, we, we pray that you would make us aware of the times of our lives, of the proclivity, proclivities that we have, of the temptation that exists, <laughs> to take the spotlight, the glory that you deserve and, and shine it on ourselves in some way, or kind of stand on the edge of that spotlight and hope that it shines on us too. Help us to see why this is such a big deal to you. Help us to become a, a big deal to us. 
And help us in this culture where everyone wants to self-promote and influence and, and show their accolades to the world. Equip us to live differently. Let us be a powerful force in this East Bay as we humbly go out and serve our neighbor. As we give expecting nothing in return. As we go the extra mile for folks who ask things of us. As we turn the other cheek when we're insulted. Let us do these things and, and receive no credit for them, but let, we pray, you receive the glory for these things. Let people look at our lives and say, well, what is it in this person that is so different? And whether it's us that says it or you say it to them, let them somehow see that it's you. Let them even see it in the way that we refuse to take credit, to take remuneration, to, to take accolades. And let us start to live a, a humbler way this week, a purer way this week, where our lives are for you and for you alone. I pray for anyone today who's here and doesn't have a relationship with the living God, who's been living in either their own spotlight or in the darkness. I pray that the, the light would shine on you in this moment and they would look to you and say, I, I want what that God has for me. I need forgiveness of my sins. I need a new life. I need to be transformed. I need a new heart. And God, may you be faithful to answer that prayer, step into their lives and start to bring purity and integrity and Christ-likeness in all that they do. I pray that for all of us, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.